Hello, everybody. This is Derek Demeter with the Emil Bueller Planetarium. And of course, joining me tonight is our uh, planetarium specialist, Justin Cirillo. Hey, Justin, looks like you're in outer space tonight. Oh, yeah. I'm flying all over the place. I love this virtual background. This is the first time I've tried this, and I was a little nervous because I, I, my ears always disappeared into the virtual <laughs> darkness. And But I'm, I'm getting used to this. I kind of like it. Now you need a green screen to make it complete. So Right, right. All right, excellent. And uh, joining me tonight, we have two special guests from the Imaloa Astronomy Center in Hawaii. Uh, we have Kalipa Babayan and we have Emily Peavy. And we're going to be talking about today um, introduction to wayfinding. And I'm really excited about this. Um, and it's been something I've been really wanting to do as part of our cultural astronomy series at the planetarium. And what better way? Uh, normally, what we do when we do public shows in the planetarium, we have different cultural astronomy shows. But how cool is it because the fact that we are um, able to meet virtually, we actually can bring in experts and have them give you a program tonight. So again, I'm really, of course, uh, for those in Hawaii, uh, what actually, I'm trying to remember, what time is it right now? Is it like one o'clock? Yep. So? One o'clock, yes. Yeah. For you, it's afternoon. Um, <laughs> but for us, it's evening. Uh, but, you know, it, whatever time you're at in the world, if you're, if you're viewing this, uh, hopefully you're enjoying yourself. And uh, like always, uh, Justin and, and I as well, because actually uh, our two special guests will be presenting the program tonight. We will be following the um, comments and the Facebook. So for those that are on the Facebook Live, uh, you know, don't feel shy. Bring out some questions. Uh, our special guests would love to, to entertain some questions from you. And um, other than that, so sit back, relax, and uh, I'm going to let uh, you both uh, begin the program. So, uh, Kalipa or Emily, how, however you want to start it. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, ju I'll just jump in, uh, Derek. Uh, All right, sounds great. Aloha. Aloha. Um, uh, it's a pleasure for Emily and I to be here to present to the, to the audience this evening. Um, uh, my name is Kalipa Baibayan. I am the navigator in residence at the Imilo Astronomy Center of Hawaii. And Emily, for a lack of a better description, is is our astronomy expert. Anything that has to do with the stars, that's her forte. And so it gives us guys great pleasure for us, for us to have this interaction, um, this conversation between Emily and I and, and, and the audience, because uh, I bring a, a unique perspective about the, um, uh, a cultural presentation on, on how uh, oceanic people use the stars to to help guide their 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 voyaging canoes as they settle the islands. And Emily uses her expertise to help make the connection to uh, a Western science. Um, so I'm going to just dive right into the presentation. The way we're going to do this is uh, uh, I'm going to uh, share some content to get the uh, community out there familiar with what we're, we're talking about. And once we have a background. We're going to dive into uh, the cultural astronomy uh, by describing how we build our compass along the horizon and how we divide the night sky up into what we call the four star families. And basically what we do is we take the dome of the, of the night sky and we divide it up into four sections and, and we'll guide the audience through each section of the night sky for the, uh, for the solar year. So, okay, we'll get started then. All right, we open screen. So yeah, I, I call this presentation uh, Helani Koluna, yeah, a sky above, and it's really about the culture's perspective that 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 uh, we as an oceanic people, in losing the sight of land, you discover the stars. Uh, Emily and I work at the Imilolo Astronomy Center of Hawaii. It was built how many years ago, Emily? Ten. Well, uh, more than that, 2006, and now it's 2020. Oh, oh gosh. Yeah. <laughs> so 13 years ago, 14, 14 years ago. 14, yeah. yeah. It was built as a, um, as a, uh, a science center that helps to um, connect um, the indigenous uh, uh, cultural astronomy story with, with uh, the practice of uh, 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 the practice of, of, of the science of astronomy and, and it we honor 
uh, the use of our esteemed mountain, Mount Ikea, which is by far the best place on the planet for, uh, uh, for observing the night, night sky in the Northern Hemisphere. But I'm just gonna start out by sharing, sharing the story. I'm a, I'm a storyteller. And the story I'm gonna share is about how uh, we as, as an oceanic people, a people who live on islands, uh, was able uh, to use the stars to guide us across the vast ocean um, and settle the last, the last geographic space on the planet, uh, what we call Oceania, or basically the, the Pacific. Yeah? So, you know, I usually dive right into the, uh, uh, into the whole oceanic exploration, but I just recently got off the canoe where we sailed around the world, it took us guys three years. And in sailing around the world, my whole perspective about, about how humans migrate and, and settle the environment changed. And that I, I understand now that the world's oceans was really the last place on the world to be explored. If we were to tell a, a truly human story, we got to go back to the, to the very beginning. And, you know, the very beginning for us uh, began in, on, on, uh, on the sub-Saharan uh, uh, grasslands, right? Where we, as uh, the last species of, 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 of hominins, the homo sapiens, emerge on this planet, right? We emerge out of the trees as, as bipedalists with, with large craniums. And our first days on the planet, as we sat around and stared up at night, we tilted our head back, uh, heads back on this appendage called our neck, and we looked up at the sky and we said, wow, and we wondered. And so ever since we began wondering about the night sky, uh, it makes astronomy the oldest science known to humankind. But to tell us stories of how Homo sapiens uh, uh, develop their, uh, their unique skill set, we begin with, with us appearing 190,000 years ago in, in, in places like Kenya and, and Ethiopia. About about 200,000 years ago, we know our species was on this planet. About 10,000 years into our human history, the world goes into a deep freeze and expands the Sahara des Desert exponentially. And basically it changes the climate, it changes the food resources, and our people, our homo sapien ancestors, we begin to migrate. And we begin to migrate all the way to the edge of South Africa, to the very southern limits, as we look for warmer weather to, to, uh, uh, to reside in. Yeah. And here along the coast of, uh, of, of uh, South Africa in a place called Muscle Bay, when we sail the, the, the canoe around the world, we're able to stop here and hear the very uh, compelling story of how the first humans came to, uh, came to inhabit this planet. So here we are walking towards the very margins of, of, of South Africa. We can go no further because the, the, the ocean is before us, right? And so here along the coast of South Africa, we begin to settle along the coastline, yeah? living intermittently in these, uh, in these coastal caves. And about maybe 20 years ago, um, some archeologists explored these caves and found the first settlement of the first human apartment on, on, on this planet, right? And their story about how the humans came to settle this, this South African coastline is, is, is truly amazing. So they say that the human population could possibly have come from no more than 200 early humans, right? And you have all these different uh, uh, um, groups of humans living along the coast in, uh, intermittently in caves. And for maybe 100,000 years, we are developing all the traits that we know as uniquely human, uh, uh, finely shaped small uh, stone tools, different kind of uh, art pendants that we would, would decorate our, our bodies with. And the, the, the ones, one thing that, 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 that is that we're developing that makes us distinctly different from every other human species is our language, right? Is our language. 
And the way we develop language, right? We're just sitting around campfires, people sitting around campfires and, and uh, uh, you know, several caves down, there's another group of people. And we just begin by gossiping, right? The humans are, that's the thing that we enjoy most is we like to gossip. So we're just making up stories about what, what the next tribe is doing a couple caves down, uh, down the ways. And, and so we begin very rudimentary, basic language. But the one thing that, that, that really moved our development as humans was we learn how to exploit the natural resources of the ocean, right? Uh, the, the, the seafood resources is high in, in protein uh, enzymes and it a acts like a, a brain fertilizer. So we're harvesting uh, sea, uh, shellfish and we're eating uh, fish and we're eating the carcasses of, 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 of washed up whales. And so we're not only developing skills, by, but biologically and physiological, physiologically, we're changing our, our bodies. And what happens is as we explore and learn to adapt along the coastlines, humans become aquatic. We learn how to swim on, on, on a buoyed by the large kelps of, uh, large seabeds of kelps. As the earth warms, we start to migrate out of, out of South Africa after about 100,000 years. And we migrate throughout the whole continent of Africa and across Europe and Asia. As we're migrating, we're finding that th there are other hominid species, right? Neanderthals in, in, in Europe, uh, Denisovians in, in Siberia and Russia, and uh, Homo erectus in Asia. But we become, in 200,000 years, we become the last hominid species to survive on this planet. But there are no other hominid species. We're at the end of the trail, right? We become the last. And about 50,000 years ago, we arrived on the coastline of Asia. Yeah? And on the coastline of Asia, there are two subcontinents, right? There's the Sunda Peninsula, which makes up Borneo and Java, and there's the Sahu Peninsula, which makes up New Guinea, Australia, and Tasmania, right? There are small waterways that separate, separate these, these subcontinents, but the waterway, the largest waterway is only 40 nautical miles, right? It doesn't take any kind of navigation skill to get across 40 nautical miles. You can, you can get across those 40 nautical miles, which is by tying a couple logs together and floating. It doesn't take any navigational skill because you can see ahead, okay? And so, so about 50,000 years ago, we get and we settle Australia. We, we the first homo sapien species to, to, we basically walk into Australia. But then about 10,000 years ago, yeah, 10,000 years ago, the waterways fill in and now those early pedestrian people that walked into Australia from, uh, from Sunda were permanently landlocked. We cannot, we, we cannot go, we cannot go back out because we have, we don't have the means, we don't have the technology to cross those expanded waterways. And so for about 40,000 years, we end up living in, 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 in these subcontinents without any way of, of exploring. By about 5,000 years ago, a new race of people appear on the planet, okay? Basically from Fujian, which is this area here, in reaction to the rising sea levels of the earth warming, right? These people migrate to Taiwan. And today, every oceanic culture and race takes its genetic roots from Taiwan the island of Taiwan. So we, oceanic people, our roots are basically, we're Asian, we're Chinese. That's, that's definitive, that's, that's through DNA, right? That's, we, we, know, we know very, um, we know distinctly where our race originated from. Yeah. So about four or five, th uh, 4,000 years ago, we start to develop the technology that allows us to, to 
explore and settle our environment. We start to build sea craft that are capable of, of, of sailing for hundreds and thousands of miles. And we're able to develop a, a, a navigational culture that becomes highly sophisticated, right? So here we are 4,000 years ago in, in Taiwan. And by about 2,500 years ago, we're here, we're here in uh, the New Hebrides, at New, New Caledonia. Uh, as we're migrating down, we're finding that all these places are already settled, right? They're already settled by those early pedestrian cultures that walked into the Pacific. Uh, and so uh, we are, we are a, a distinct culture. We speak the language of Austronesia. Austronesia is, 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 a, is one of the uh, four language uh, families of, of, of the planet. Uh, and we're car carrying, uh, we're, we're, we're farmers, we are traders, we are very skilled survivalists. But as we move down to these islands, we're finding that all these islands are previously settled. And we're sailing in the direction of the, 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 the prevailing trade winds. The trade winds blow from the Americas across the Pacific into Asia. So we're sailing into the direction of the, of the trade winds. We finally get to an island that's not settled. And that sets off an idea in our mind that if we keep on sailing in the direction of the prevailing trade winds yeah, from west to east, we're gonna find more and more islands that are not settled, right? We have a, a, a cultural practice that's called primogeniture in which the eldest sibling inherits all wealth. So if you're a younger sibling wanting to have your own kingdom and residence, you have to go out and find it. And so that's the, the social impetus for uh, moving from west to east. But eventually we get here to the Polynesian Triangle. And within the Polynesian Triangle, uh, Hawaii was only settled maybe uh, 1,100 years ago. Uh, Rapa Nui off the, off the corner of the, of the map of the right side is, was settled about uh, uh, 1,000 years ago. And New Zealand was the last place in Polynesia to be settled 800 years ago, right? And again, we did this settlement of, uh, of uh, Oceania by, by creating uh, sophisticated sea craft and a sophisticated system of wayfinding and navigation, All right? Yeah. The range of their exploration is 2,300 kilometers. Yeah. The people that settled the Pacific also got as far as South America, yeah? We know that because we have the cultigen that we, uh, we consume in the Pacific the, the sweet potato and the sweet potato has its origins here in South America. But we also get as far as Madagascar here in, in, in the West. Yeah, it's only a couple hundred miles from, from Africa. Madagascar was never settled by Africans. It was settled by, by people from the Pacific. Yeah. We know the exact trail that people moved into the Pacific because they left artifacts behind. And this one particular artifact is called lapita. It's a dentate stamp pottery. And, as, and if you drop a pot, right, it breaks into many, many pieces. So just by following the trail of clay pot, you can tell what direction you did. But, but we also understand where we came from um, through linguistics and other, other uh, archaeological artifacts. This is a stone adze, right? Stone adzes are made out of basalt. Uh, 10 years ago, two researchers did a study of stone edges located on, that they found on, on, on coral atolls. Because the stone edges is made out of, out of, out of basalt and, and they're finding them on coral atolls, they know that those stone edges had to be imported in there. So what they did was uh, they employed a, 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 a test called plasma mass spectrometry whereby they melt the stone down into a plasmatic source. And once they get the plasmatic signature, they can look at in and they can identify the chemical and neuro neurological uh, uh, footprint or fingerprint of the stone as, and they can identify the exact lava eruption it came from. And in this case, if that stone ad began here in Hawaii, they found this stone ad down here in, in, in the Tumoto archipelago. And so they know that that stone ad had to have been transported some 4,300 4, kilometers uh, to that small coral atoll. 
And this is where that stone axe came from. It came from a place called, uh, uh, on the island of Kolabi, from a place called Keala Ikahiki. That word translates into the pathway to foreign lands. In the 1970s, we began to, to want to confirm um, our, our origins. And so we built uh, the Sele Canoe Hokulea, which was a replica of a, of a double-hulled voyaging canoe. Uh, we created the Polynesian Voyaging Society, a, a, a group that would study and research uh, early uh, oceanic migrations. And then we recruited a, a Micronesian uh, from the tiny island of, of Sarawa in the, in the Carolines to come to Hawaii to, uh, to employ his system of navigation uh, to navigate Hokulea on a traditional trip from Hawaii to Tahiti. That's about 2,200 nautical miles. And he did that in uh, 1976, right? Created the largest single celebration of, uh, uh, of, of a voyaging culture in, in uh, uh, in Polynesian over 600 years. But Mao was supposed to, he navigated Hokulea from Hawaii to Tahiti without instruments. He was supposed to do the same thing on the return trip, but he was extremely exhausted and he left the voyage in Tahiti. So he left the canoe in Tahiti uh, without no, without any kind of a non-instrument navigator. So they had to navigate Hokulea back uh, to Hawaii from Tahiti with instruments. On board that trip, yeah, was this young man here, Nainoa Thompson. And he, very intelligent young Hawaiian, began to take copious notes in his notebook. And when he got back to Hawaii, he decided that he would, he would select a course of study at the University of Hawaii, whereby he could re-engineer the art of non-instrument navigation, right? And so he did that for two years. He, he worked really hard in developing that. And in 1980, he was gonna, he planned to sail Hokulea back to, back to uh, Tahiti without any instruments. But right before the trip was to take off, he was, uh, he had a lot of different issues with, with the spirituality and, and things were plaguing him. So he talked to his father about it. And, and the father said, simply, you gotta go and find Mao, that traditional navigator. You gotta recruit him to bring him back to Hawaii and you've gotta work with him. And I think that'll resolve your issue. So, so Nainoa did, he went to Saipan, he found Mao, asked Mao to come to Hawaii, Mao came to Hawaii, and, um, and Mao began to round out Nainoa's training. So Nainoa's system of navigation, I'm gonna talk about navigation now, is, uh, is based upon math and science, right? Because he had to use academics to rebuild his art without a traditional teacher. Mao's system of navigation is, uh, is is traditional it's called wayfinding it's it's an indigenous system of orientation what happened was when ma brought his system to Hawaii and nainoa had his they laid it down side by side and they were exactly the same okay. we're talking about non-instrument navigation and there's only so many human ways you can do that to navigate without instruments yeah it's only so many ways you can do that to navigate without instruments and so there are three skills you needed to, uh, you needed to, to wayfind. Right? You, need, you need to orientate the canoe. You need a device. Next, you need to dead reckon or locate, locate the vessel on the ocean. And last, the last and most important thing is you need to make landfall, right? Because if you don't make landfall, you perish on the ocean. So the first thing is the device you need, right? Which is a compass, right? Everyone's familiar with the magnetic compass. The magnetic compass works by, by that, that needle, in the, the, the magnetized needle in, in, in the middle of the compass pointing to a place we call magnetic north. Once you identify that one point, you can, you can fix the rest of the points on the, uh, on the compass. Yeah, all compasses, whether it's indigenous or, or Western, right? basically are divided up into 32 points. Same thing with this traditional oceanic compass. The circle of stones represent the edge of the horizon, right? They represent the edge of the horizon, right? This is our compass, yeah? This circle, this edge represents the, the horizon. 
And basically, the circle is divided into two sections. Okay? Kikina, which means the arriving or east, and Komohana, which means the setting or the entry in the west, right? Stars move from east in the arriving section of the compass to the entering side of the compass in the west, right? Stars move in parallel tracks from one side of the compass to the other, right? Our compass is basically a tropical device, right? And that's what makes it very useful is that the stars within the tropics rise pretty much vertically, right? The azimuth angles are not that sharp. So, so it's a practical device developed specifically for the circumstance of living in the tropics. Like I always ask the question, well, if you're living around the North Pole, where is your north? Where, where is your direction north? Is it on the horizon or is it above your head? Right. So you can understand how this device allowed us guys to settle the tropics because the islands of uh, uh, the tropical Pacific all is, lies within this, the boundaries of the tropics. So by just by circumstance, uh, we created a device that was useful that helped us guys navigate. Okay. So stars rise on one edge of the horizon mm. and to the, to the other edge of the horizon, right? There are 32 names of the compass, right? All right? But the names repeat itself, yeah, four times. So here, let's just look at the direction east, right? On either side of east is, is what we call a star house, right? The first star house is La, yeah? Right? If you have a, if you have a La in the east, yeah, you also have a La in the west. And stars migrate, if they rise in this house La, they're gonna set in that house La on the opposite side of the horizon. If they rise here in the house we call Aina, the second house, it's gonna sit in the house we call Aina. So they move in parallel tracks from one edge of the horizon. Okay, but this is an oceanic device for orientation. So anything you can visually see with your eyes, you can use to navigate. So celestially, we use, we use the sun as our primary focus. Uh, and then we use the moon, the planets, and the stars, right? But you can also employ the use of the sea swells and the wind. And the sea swells move from one quadrant, yeah, across the compass and exits the other, the other quadrant. So here we have the house we call Manu. If the wave was to roll in from this house we call Manu, it's gonna roll to the middle of the compass where you're standing and it's gonna exit the same house on the opposite side. And this is the beauty of this device is that that it's symmetrical, that it's natural, yeah? That everything within the environment fits within the circle of the horizon, yeah? And the circle of the horizon is made up of any place that the sky touches the land or the sea. Yeah. So our system is, 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 very, is visual, right? You can only navigate by being the eyes of the canoe, by, 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 by using bearings along the edge of the compass, along this visual horizon. The second uh, element is uh, being able to position your canoe on a, on a given course line. Uh, we use the algebraic formula, speed multiple, multiplied by time equals distance. So we have two measured spots on the canoe, on the front and the back. And basically we've created this, this algebraic formula where speed, right? Speed by counting the bubbles that how long, how many seconds it floats from one part of the canoe, uh, uh, the front of the canoe to the back of the canoe, right? We take that 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 count like we go one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand, five. If it takes five seconds, then you're moving at five knots. If it takes six seconds, you're moving at at four knots. If it takes four seconds, you're moving at four knots. Four knots. Anyway, there's a mathematical formula for figuring out speed. You take the speed, you multiply it over time, which is 12 hours, sunrise to sunset, and then that gives you a distance, right? So you just you're just doing all this math and math to measure the progress of the canoe, right? And sunrise to sunset is 12 hours. So if I was to go five knots for 12 hours, I've gone 60 miles over over half a day. If I continue that speed for another 12 hours, I've gone 120 miles. 
That's the math and the science part. This is Nainoa system of navigation, very precise, very calculated. Mao doesn't use that. Mao internalized, he can't tell you how many, how fast the canoe is going by, by knots, but he can feel the speed of the canoe. And based upon the familiarity of him, him sailing many, many years between his islands, he knows how many moons it would take based upon the fuel of the canoe for him to get from one place to the next. Yeah. Again, our system of navigation is all visual. Yeah. It takes, it takes navigation for, uh, for 12 hours at a, uh, 24 hours at a time. Uh, yeah. In the morning here, and I know is looking at the, uh, looking at the horizon, he's looking at the sun, the sun marks the horizon, it's a definite spot on, you, on your compass, then he's lining up the sea swells, then he's feeling the wind, and he entire, internalizes all this motion into, into his system of orientation and guidance on the canoe. And lastly, you can also fix position by being able to measure the altitude of different celestial bodies across the, uh, uh, from the horizon up to the meridian. And we basically do that by calibrating our hands. Our hands are calibrated exactly, so we know how many degrees it is to the first crease, to the second crease, to the third crease. And we're able to measure the distance of stars as it passes through meridian, and we can get the calculated distance between stars and the horizon. Like this star is, uh, this is the Southern Cross. It is our probably our, our best clue for determining the latitude of the Hawaiian Islands. When this star is, is upright, yeah, when the top star and the bottom star are equal to the, to the horizon, you're at the latitude of the Hawaiian Islands. So it's basically six degrees between the top star and the bottom star, right? Six degrees. When you can get that distance to be equal to the horizon, you're at the latitude of the Hawaiian Islands. And you simply turn your canoe downwind and you still so to Hawaii, it works. We've done that 11 times using this, this constellation to, to, to navigate by. We also have got different clues in, in the natural environment. This is um, a meridian marker wall. It's, it's, a, it's like a compass. And so this notch here, right? This is prehistoric, marks the celestial meridian, right? Again, this is the Southern Cross, yeah? Southern Cross above it marks the celestial meridian. And then the last thing you need to do is the stars, the altitude of stars will always tell you when you're getting close to islands. So then you need to go out and look for clues for finding land, seaweed, birds. Birds are the best clues for, for finding land. Certain kinds of birds, the white tern and the black and the gray tern. When you see these birds, you're probably within two or three days of, of finding land, guaranteed. Lastly, I just wanna um, show you guys a quick video about uh, uh, about the Malama Honua worldwide voyage, which took place from 2013 to 2017, where we sailed around the planet. Uh, again, it was about about uh, learning about the largest incubator for regulating oxygen and the largest regulator for the uh, world's weather, which is the world's oceans. And we 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 took this experience to to pass on uh, uh, the traditions of, of wayfinding and voyaging. Uh, to a whole new younger generation. That's my daughter next to me. Seven thousand years ago, the first really oceanic people came out of China. They came out of Taiwan. Then you get the Polynesia, this oceanic country bounded by Hawaii in the north and New Zealand in the southwest and Rapa Nui in the east. 10 million square miles, bigger than Russia. And it was discovered by these extraordinary people. They were really the astronauts of our ancestors. They were the greatest explorers on the face of the earth. You know, our ancestors not were only just great navigators, they're great stewards of these islands. The time that the first Europeans came, the journals of Captain Cook talked about, you know, large population, maybe 800,000. That, that's amazing. It could be even higher. It's approaching maybe the numbers of people that are living in Hawaii today. They figured it out. 
how to live well on these islands. And I think that is the challenge of the time for planet Earth and all of humanity. It's to figure that out. How are you going to do that? Hokulea is pulling us into a direction of asking the question, are you going to be responsible and are you going to take action? Are you going to do something with what you have? You got to avoid your career. Hokulea, to us, to go around the world, has this enormous potential to go to 40, 50 countries on the planet, to be with the great navigators on Earth. And I'm not talking about those in canoes. I'm talking about those who are doing things to give kindness and compassion to the Earth and those who live on it. Those navigators. We're not going to change the world. But we're going to go and build a network of people around the Earth who are going to change it. And our job is to help them be successful. Going to go around the world, and we're going to take the risk to do it because the greater risk is to not act, the greater risk is to be active, the greater risk is to remain ignorant, and the greater risk is not to take action. In three years, Hokula had traveled more than 40,000 nautical miles, stopping at over 100 ports of call across 27 nations. Her crews connected with some of the world's greatest influencers and engaged with those creating innovative solutions to protect our island Earth. In my humble opinion, the success of the Worldwide Voyage was really building relationships from strangers from around the world. I watched our crew members every single place we went to. Uh, everybody that they met was treated with respect and with decency. That was the key and the core to the success of the voyage. That is why we have strangers turn into relationships and relationships are now coming together as a movement around the same thing. So uh, I'm gonna stop sharing now, and we're gonna transition into into the night sky. And how do we how do we define the shape of the night sky based upon the star field that circles over here, overhead? So we're uh, gonna transition mm -hmm. and bring Emily into the conversation now. Sorry about that. My speakers said they weren't working, and now they're working. Okay. 
So yes, thank you so much, Kalepa. And um, before we transition to the nighttime sky, one thing I really want to emphasize is a lot of the specific things about navigation, about wayfinding that we can teach you today, especially anything that relates to a name, it's not ancient. It just, it isn't. It's 40 to 50 years old. It's something that was established with Mao or Nainoa Thompson. And these things are modern. They, as you learned about in the Worldwide Voyage, these have a modern use. These techniques, these, uh, everything that we're using that we can teach you today is being used today in our modern world. And I think that's a common misconception is that this is something that only belongs in the past and it's not. It's something that we are using today and it is something that, that is important in our modern world. So I'm going to share screen. I'm going to take you guys into the planetarium. Here we are. And I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction for navigation and introduction into the star compass. So right now we're looking at the sky as it would look at sunset. And if you just knew that, say you're out in the ocean and you're looking at the sky and you know that it is the time for sunset and you see where the sun is in the sky, what would tell that tell you about the direction of the sun? So here in our little planetarium, we see where the sun is and we see that the sun is about to set. So what would that tell us about that half of the sky? That tells us that that is going to be the direction of west or Kumohana. Now the sun does not always set exactly in the direction of west. It will vary based off the time of year. We're actually looking at the sky as it would look back in February for some other reasons. And so the sun is going to be setting more towards the north of west. We'll have time move forward here. But now that we know that that is the direction of west, that is Kumohana, we can then use that in order to uh, figure out the rest of our navigational compass to build our compass along our horizon. So I want you to imagine the, the circle that you're seeing on your screen, I want you to imagine that that is the sky above you. This is our portable planetarium here. And as this is the sky above you, the first thing that you would do as a navigator is you would face the direction of west, the direction of Kumohana, and you would wrap your hands around the direction of west, Kumohana. And then we're going to move our left hand over our left shoulder, making a 90 degree angle. And that's going to land in the exact direction of south or Hema. And then if we do that with our right hand, which is called a cow, we move it over our right shoulder, it'll land in the direction of north or a cow. And then if we think that if we did another 90 degrees from either one of those directions, then that is going to land in the direction of Hikina or the east. So by making one observation, knowing what time of the year it is, what day it is, and by tracking where the sun set, we, found, we now know where west is, and now we also know where north, south, and east are, just by doing some simple math along our horizon. Now we've also taken our 360 degree sky and we have broken it up into four pieces. What is 360 divided by four? 90. 90. <laughs> I'm used to doing this when I can hear the audience. It's 90 degrees. Yes. And so then we're going to, so we have uh, a horizon broken up into four degree, four sections of 90 degrees, which are called quadrants. And these quadrants also have names. In the northeast, we have Ko'olau. In the southeast, we have Malanai. In the southwest, we have Kona. And then in the northwest, we have Ko'olua. So we've now taken a 360 degree sky and we split it up into four pieces, but for our navigation purposes, we want a little bit more precision. We want to break up our navigational compass into 32 pieces, like Kalepa was mentioning earlier on. So now what is 360 divided by 32? If you guys can do mental math, then I'm really proud of you. <laughs> 11 and Way to break that up is, huh? 11 and a quarter degrees. Zero. 11 and a quarter de degrees. Yes, Kalepa knows that one. 
11.25 degrees. If you wanted to do that one easy mental math, you could round up a little bit and then it'll get you in the range. Okay, but 11.25 degrees, and that is going to be the width of each of our houses, our halles. We call them halles because this is where the stars live. And as Kalepa mentioned, we have 32 halles. We already found four of them, Komohana, Hema, Hikina, and Akau. And now we're going to putting up the rest of our compasses, of, of our houses. And as a navigator on Hopulea, as a modern day navigator, you would need to memorize all 32 of these unique names. So are you guys ready to start memorizing these names? Here we Let's go. Let's do it. Let's go. Yeah. Okay. La, Aina, Noyo, Manu, Naleo, and Haka. Whew. You guys just said 28 names. But it did not feel like you said 28 names. As Coletta mentioned, our compass here is symmetrical. And I'm going to pause for a second because my southern sky is cut off in my view. So I'm just going to reshare my screen after I make a quick adjustment. Yeah, so our compass is symmetrical and our houses within the compass are repeating each other. And that will reflect on how stars will rise and set in the sky. A star will always rise in one house in the eastern half of the sky and then set in that same house in the western half of the sky. Are you guys able to see the southern? The yeah, southern? I, I, I can see it. Okay. okay, maybe it's just cut off on my computer. Okay. So to demonstrate that fact, I'm going to turn on our star trails actually decrease the amount of stars here so it doesn't get too intense. So what I'm doing is we are now tracking the motion of the stars as they appear to move across the sky. Stars rise in the east, climb high up above the sky, and then set in the west. And here, if you track a star, let's say we track a star coming out of Noyo Malanai, we'll see that it'll come, climb high up in the sky and set in Noyo Kona. So our star will always rise in one house and then set in that same house. My favorite expression of that fact, one of the navigators who likes to present with us, he always likes to ask the audience, who here uh, goes to sleep in one house and then wakes up in a different house in the next morning? Does anybody do that? Well, if you do, I want to party with you. <laughs> but... <laughs> Our stars are like the rest of us. They're going to stay in their same house. They're going to rise in one house in the eastern half of the sky and then set in that same house in the western half of the sky. So here is our, our compass along our horizon, but in order to be using the compass with the stars, we also need to be memorizing some stars in our sky. And so we have four navigational star lines that we'll be used in order to help us navigate to memor will be used with our compass to help us determine where we are and which direction we'll need to go. And to become a navigator, you would need to memorize more than a hundred stars, meaning you need to know how bright the star is in the sky, where the star is in the sky in relation to the stars around it, when that star is going to be in the sky based off the season and the time of night. And most importantly, you need to know how that star is going to interact with this compass on your horizon based on the locations that you're going to be sailing through. So with all that in mind, the first uh, star line that we're going to look at is called Kekau Makali'i, which means the Baylor of Makali'i. This is the star line that really dominates our sky during our winter season. So this star line, um, not really up in the sky right now, but this star line starts off all the way up here with this shape. This hexagon shape, if, if you know Western constellations, is called Auriga, which is supposed to be a guy holding a sheep. Here we see this shape as Hoku Le. The word Hoku means star, and Le is our, our beautiful flower necklaces. So Hoku Le is then a lay of stars. And I think Hoku Le looks more like a lay of stars than it looks like a dude holding a sheep, which is what it's supposed to be if you're looking at the Greek constellations. 
Uh, then this star line takes this nice gentle arc passing down to Nana Mua and Nana Hope, the brother looking forward and the brother looking back. It goes to Puana, the blossoming flower, and then to Aa, and then drops down into the south. And Keikau o Makali'i is the baler of Makali'i. A baler for a canoe is a scoop that you would use to scoop up water that might be flooding your canoe. But Keikau o Makali'i is not a baler for water, it is a baler for the stars. And as you stay up over the evening, you'll see how it scoops up the stars from the horizon in Hikina, the Hikina half of our sky and scatters the stars in the Kumohana half of our sky. And it's scooping up a few shapes in particular. One of the shapes that it's scooping up is the famous little star cluster of Makali'i, which is also known as the Pleiades, or the Seven Sisters. It's Kapu'ahi, the heavenly fire. It has one of my favorite shapes, Kahei Ona Akeiki, which means the string game of the child. Uh, so um, if you guys ever played a cat's cradle game where you tie the string between your fingers, that's what that's, that shape is. It's the cat's cradle game that you're playing with as you tie with the string between your fingers. And if you look closely at that shape, some people might recognize that as the shape of Orion the Hunter, which is a very recognizable shape that many people know. And, uh, as our star line is moving across our sky, I'm gonna point out one special use for the star line in order to help us determine exact east and exact west. See, there's a few lines that uh, Kalepa mentioned earlier on, and one important line that we draw in the sky is called the celestial equator. The celestial equator is if you imagine the Earth's equator wrapped around us, and then you project the Earth's equator out into the sky, it draws this line cutting over your head. Now, Celestial equator is very useful in a lot of observational astronomy, but the reason I bring it up here is if you look very carefully, you'll see that in Kahei Ona Akeiki, the one star on the corner of Orion's belt is sitting ex almost exactly on top of that celestial equator. And because that star is sitting exactly on top of that celestial equator, it's that star will always rise exactly in Hikina and set exactly in Komohana. This is true no matter where you are in the world, but it's much easier to observe it when you're in the tropics because they're going to be entering the horizon at a much steeper angle. So if you are able to identify that star in the sky and able to track exactly where it rose or exactly where it's going to set, then you know exactly where east is or you know exactly where west is. Now, if you know, say you know, you're watching it rise and now you know exactly where east is. But using the math that we just did with, in building our compass, if you know exactly where east is, you already know exactly where north, south, west are. You know exactly where Aina Ko'olau is. You know where every single mark on your compass is by positively identifying a star, determining where it rose and where it's going to set. And now you know exactly which direction you're facing, no matter which direction you look. So that is how our navigators can use the stars interacting with the compass in order to determine very, very precisely where they are. This is a science. This is an intense science. And even what I'm teaching you now, I always say I can teach the first five minutes of navigation or wayfinding 101. It gets so much more deep and so much more interesting. But I don't want to take up a, too much time unless I you say go on, but I'm going to speed the sky through so that we can take a look at a few more of our navigational star lines. And as we're letting the sky move over our heads, so we'll have the star line for our spring season, which is dominating our, our early evening sky right now. And our star line for the spring season is called Ivi Kuomo, or the backbone. Here it is rising up. Ka'ivi Kumo'o is truly enormous. It starts all the way at the North Star, Hopupa'a, fixed star or stuck star in the sky. Then it goes through a shape, another shape that many people are very familiar with, which is well known as the Big Dipper. Here we see it as Nahiku, meaning the seven. 
and it takes this nice arc going from on from the handle of the Big Dipper or the arc of Nahiku and it follows that arc down to the bright yellow star Hopulea, the star of happiness. You continue the arc to Hikianalia, down to Mei, and then start straight down all the way to Hanai Akamalama, which is the Southern Cross. And I'm going to bring up the meridian, which is one of the lines, the sky lines that are special lines in the sky that Kalepa mentioned earlier. We're going to line up that Southern Cross there. So the meridian is a line that you're imagining in the sky that's cutting from exact north, going straight up over your head, going down to exact south. And here we can see how Hanai Akamalama, the Southern Cross, can be a very, very useful thing when you have it lined up with the meridian. And um, that one picture that Kalepa showed earlier, that was a really cool shot uh, showing a meridian marker where it's, there's a hole cut in a wall and that hole, when you're standing in the right position, is going to mark how the meridian is cutting straight up over your head, which can be very useful whenever you, you need to use the, nat the nighttime sky for anything. And here you can see that another thing that Kalepa mentioned, so the, when the height of the cross matches the distance from the bottom of the cross to the horizon, that is when you're at the latitude of Hawaii. So the star line is going to look different based off of different latitudes. You guys, you're at 28 degrees north. I thought, let's go up to 28 degrees north. You can see how our star line or how our sky looks so different when we're looking at the sky from a different latitude. This is latitude for you guys in Florida. And you don't really get to see the Southern Cross that much. I'm sorry. But if we return back to Hawaii, you can see that Southern Cross is rising higher in the sky. And when the Southern Cross is two fingers above the horizon, then we know we're at the latitude of the Hawaiian Islands. But if we went even farther, say, let's go to 19 degrees south. Actually, go, we'll go 17 degrees south. We'll go all the way down to Tahiti, and we'll see how the star line looks so different as we go down to different latitudes. And here you see something that's really stunning about if you're down in the Southern Hemisphere. The Southern Hemisphere gets a much more absolutely gorgeous view of the Milky Way in the Northern Hemisphere. Oh. Derek, that's why you're always heading down to the Dry Tortugas, right? That Milky Way and that Southern Cross. Yeah, actually, uh, Emily, uh, down by the Dry Tortugas, we're about, that's about 24 degrees. Um, and so the Southern Cross is visible uh, from that latitude and we can see it. So now I'm thinking, I'm like, oh man, I want to go back and I want to use this method. <laughs> so I'm excited to, uh, to try that Road out. Road trip. Yeah. <laughs> nice. And you know what? Dry Tortugas is further than anything you can get to in Florida. So that's great social distancing right there. <laughs> so here you can see when we bring up our meridian, the Southern Cross is, down here in Tahiti is a lot farther from the horizon that it was for you guys in the Dry Tortugas or for us in Hawaii. <laughs> so uh, getting back to the star line, um, here we'll head back to Hawaii. One of my favorite things about this star line in particular, Ka'ivi Kuomo'o, its name means um, the backbone and it's representing a lineage, lineage as you're going down the star line. So uh, the star line going from the North Star to the Southern Cross can only be seen at certain latitudes. But no matter where you are on the planet Earth, you'll be able to see parts of the star line in the sky. Let's, let's speed time forward and we'll take a view at the Milky Way. 
Well, as we go on with the star line, one of my, my favorite little tidbits about the star line is we have these two stars that are sitting right next to the Southern Cross, Kamaile Mua and Kamaile Hope. Uh, these are also known as Beta Centauri and Alpha Centauri. And Kamaile Hope, Alpha Centauri, is famous for being the closest star system to our sun and our solar system. Now the thing is, when you see these stars in the nighttime sky, these stars are going to appear to have a very, very similar brightness to them, but the stars could not be any more different from each other. The star Kamaile Hope, Alpha Centauri, is a system of smaller stars that are fainter, that are close to us, uh, only four light years away, while Kamaile Mua is a system of fairly bright stars that is a lot farther away from us. Kamaile Mua is actually about four hundred light years away from us. So when you go out at night and you see these two stars next to each other, even though they appear to be the same brightness, the light from Kamaile Hope that enters your eyes, the light from Kamaile Hope that enters your eyes left that star last U.S. presidential term four years ago, and the star that enters your eyes from Kamaile Mua left 400 years ago before the United States was a country. I always just find that interesting. So as we stayed up a little bit later, we are encountering the star line that is probably the favorite star line for all little kids everywhere. And that is the star line of Maui's fish hook. Now made famous with the Disney movie Moana. It is a star line. It is a shape of stars in our sky. If you are familiar with Western constellations, the, the shape of the fish hook is also the shape of Scorpius the scorpion. And it is pulling up the beautiful band of the Milky Way. We have Kimoi, the mischievous fish that is swimming away from the fish hook. And then we also have the navigator's triangle, which also represents a bowl of, of twine that you're attaching to the fish hook, your fishing line that's attaching to the fish hook. Uh, the navigator's triangle also symbolizes the Polynesian triangle that stretches across the ocean. So in Kleppa's presentation, he mentioned uh, the Polynesian triangle, which stretches from Hawaii to Rapa Nui, or Easter Island, to Aotearoa, or New Zealand, and back. And the three stars of the navigator's triangle represents those three islands. So you can kind of picture it as like a giant map up in, in your sky. And we'll speed time even farther through and get a look at our next navigational star line, the last navigational star line, which is Calupe a Cabello, or the great kite of Cabello which dominates the sky more during our fall seasons. So Calupe Arcavello is a giant kite which is being uh, flown up over your head. Now, um, instinctively, when you're just looking at these stars, you might not quite see a kite. How you picture it is the four stars making the square. That is the kite that is high up over your head. And then you can picture yourself holding onto these streamers of the kite, so you can like think that you're leaning back and that square of the kite is high, high up above you. And you'll notice with these star lines that they're not like Western constellations. These are stretching across great, great, great areas of the sky. And that helps our navigators track the stars going north-south as they're navigating around the world. So that's a nice uh, introduction to navigational compass and the four navigational star lines. Um, are there any questions? Because I love answering questions. Well, the main one right now is Emily or Kalipa is everyone is loving this compass. Where could someone get one of these? Uh, you know, not the digital version, of course, but mm -hmm. uh, is there a spot that to I use for night, you know, just night sky viewing? Some? Sorry? For it to use for night sky viewing, you know, basic astronomy or even advanced astronomy. Emily, do we have it on our website? Um, we, 
I don't think we currently have it on our website, but it's probably like even just a picture like this is something that we can easily put up on our website. We do have, um, we put out star charts every month on our website. Uh, the star charts don't include the full compass, but it does have uh, the four cardinal directions and the four quadrants on our star charts. They just, they just don't have all the hollies in between. And those are on our website. Excellent, all right, we're gonna point Eric, to I, I sent you uh, the website where you could probably find it, hokulia.com. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll we'll go ahead and uh, post that on our uh, Facebook uh, comment section. Um, no, this is fantastic. Um, we had a question from not really a question, but more of a statement. But I wanted to um, expand on it. So, um, so Emily, you mentioned that you were very clear that this is a modern modern uh, use of wayfinding. But you know, um, if we go back in time though to the ancestral um, oceanic people, uh, how does procession put a play in, uh, in in the viewing of the stars? Would it would have, have been different uh, the amount of time of year they would have seen it and stuff like that? Or, or how, that was actually a comment that was brought up and, and that made me think, I mean, how, I wonder how the stars would have uh, changed a little bit over the course of the year. Well, one thing I want to, and I think Kalepa has a great response for this, but one thing I do want to sneak in is really um, a lot of as I mentioned before, the specific names that we are teaching you and the specific uses for all these specific stars it is new, is 40, 50 years old. And there's not a lot of procession that happens in 40, 50 right. years. Uh, the reason why all of this is new is because all this knowledge that would have been used thousands of years ago has been lost. It was lost to number a number of factors, but all this, and it was lost and the stuff that we have is new is new because it had to get rebuilt. So um, the, this stuff has, doesn't take that much stuff, the stuff that I very, very basically taught you doesn't take that much into account. But I know Kalepa looking at a lot of these things from a historical standpoint has been thinking about how procession has affected some navigation systems. So Kalepa, do you have any comments on it? Yeah, precession happens very slowly over time. You're not going to notice the, the sky changing in a lifetime, right? You'd have to have, uh, you'd have to have some system of, of recording that information and it would have to pass over generations so you can see the shift in the night sky. Uh, th this system of, of navigation, it's not, a, it's, it's not a looking north, looking south uh, kind of orientation. It's between the rising and setting horizons. So you're looking at stars that are rising in the east and, and setting in the west. And, and so you're just marking the horizon by those stars that, that, that define the different houses along the horizon. So I'm not sure that I'm doing an adequate job of asking his question, but know that precession is, is, is a very lengthy process and you're not, gonna, you're not gonna, in a lifetime, you're not gonna notice it visibly. No so, yeah, so so really, um, you know, I think I think the question was, you know, how does procession play in it? And I think the stars would essentially be there. They just would be seen at different times of the year. So, for example, instead of, uh, you know, uh, the summer uh, star lines being seen in the summertime, they might have shifted over to, you know, the spring or something. But those star positions would basically remain. So if you're navigating the stars based off of this, uh, this compass, you're, 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 you're basically just noting those stars. So I guess they probably wouldn't have uh, noticed or cared as much whether it was in the spring, summer, fall, so on. It just that they observed those patterns of stars, they knew uh, where, where, where they, where they were uh, able to navigate. So uh, it was just, an, it was just interesting comment. I thought that would be something also to, to kind of explain from an astronomical and cultural standpoint. So I think you both answered that very, very well. Um, okay. Derek, just know that the stars, the star family system we use, that's a modern device. That right. was only created in the last 20 years. Yeah. Right, exactly. And, I, and, and, and Emily answered that question very well and that, that fact that unfortunately a lot of it was lost and that this was developed uh, in modern times. But it, it would be interesting that it, just to kind of imagine what it was back like, you know, in, in, in the uh, ancient times uh, when they were yeah. doing this kind of stuff. One of the things that Derek is always promoting here in Florida, um, and we're, we're always trying to promote to our audience that visit us at the planetarium is light pollution. Can you talk a little bit about 
how Hawaii um, uh, handles light pollution. I know, uh, or from what I understand, there are actually light pollution laws for the islands. That's gotta be a challenge where you've got this high uh, volume of, 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 um, of leisure and recreation and, and tourism. But at the same time, Hawaii, uh, many people might not realize this, is a famous for you know, having some of the largest ground-based telescopes on Earth. Can you talk a little bit about how light pollution is involved in, in your daily lives and how you're controlling that? So um, I, I think there's, there's two answers to that. And uh, one involves an island that I don't live on. <laughs> but there is Hawaii Island and then there's uh, Hawaii State. Now across Hawaii State, there's definitely um, more tourist central areas. I would definitely say Oahu has a big issue with uh, light pollution around Honolulu being such a big city. Now Hawaii Island, we're actually pretty rural over here. <laughs> Like, we're, we're not really attached to a super, super big city. And so that, that fact also lowers the light pollution that as Justin, you mentioned that uh, we have these ground-based observatories which have a big impact on our economy. And so measures have been put into place in order to decrease the amount of light pollution on our island. And uh, the main thing is uh, fewer street lights street lights that are directing light uh, down and um, different types of street lights. Uh, for the longest time, when I, especially when I first moved to Hilo, the street lights were this yellow uh, halogen lights, which were not flattering to stand underneath at all. But because it was these yellow halogen lights, astronomers on Mauna Kea could actually take that light out of their data. <laughs> because they knew exactly what wavelength that light was. So if you're looking at your data and go, oh, okay, that line right there, that's the light pollution from Kilo, and then they completely take it out. Um, those actually have been replaced recently because there was an issue because uh, those yellow halogen lights as street lights, they were the exact same color as the yellow stoplights. So if you're driving down the road and you think you see a yellow halogen light coming up, it's like, okay, I can stay at my own speed. And all of a sudden now it's a red light. Uh, that was an, I an issue for concern for traffic uh, concerns. So now uh, Hilo especially has been switching more to green LED lights, which is simply putting out less light. And once again, focusing more light on the ground where it's needed, so less light goes up in the air. And really on the big island of Hawaii, I wouldn't really say that there's much of a light pollution uh, issue. When you're in Hilo, it might interfere with things. But the nice thing about Hilo is if you drive 20 minutes out of Hilo, you're halfway into the country where it's nice and beautiful again. The biggest issue with stargazing uh, in Hilo and on the lower parts of the island is more clouds. Hilo is the rainiest city in the United States and we are clouded over most of the time. Excellent. So, uh, Justin, do we have any other questions uh, from the Facebook? Uh, um... Let me do one last scan. We, we uh, just got a lot of uh, great comments. Um, that they love the video um, that uh, Kalipa showed, so we posted a copy of that. I, we put in the uh, links to uh, the facility there also. I think we covered most everything, unless anyone has uh, kind of a last minute question. Um, I think we're uh, we're all we're all set. Excellent, and you know, uh, so uh, any any other last minute things about the Imaloa Astronomy Center that you want to you, either one of you want to mention? You know, hopefully once the pandemic is over and we'll be able to travel to Hawaii together and and visit this, I'm excited about going there and visiting it myself, and of course uh, the Big Island and many island the, the rest of the islands. Um, uh, is there anything else that you want to mention about your facility and some of the things that you do and some of the things that maybe some of our audience members may want to check out when things kind of go back to normal again? Well, we, of course, love everybody to come visit us when visiting the islands is a little bit more of a possibility. Um, we have, but at present, we still have a bunch of interesting resources on our website that you can explore intera that interacts Hawaiian culture and astronomy. And one big project, which is going to get a big press release next week, is our Ahua Hei Inua program. Ahua Hei Inua means to call forth a name. And with Iniloa Astronomy Center, we work with 
the observatories on Mauna Kea and we work with Hawaiian immersion students and teachers and when there's a really big interesting new discovery that uh, part, at least partially takes place on Mauna Kea, we work with these two groups in order to ensure that that discovery is given a Hawaiian name. We're going to be expanding out some of our information on objects that have already been named with that. And next week, there's going to be a big announcement of an object that was named last year that was just published about, or is in the process of being published about. So yeah, we'd love to. We'd love to hope, uh, vis uh, have visitors uh, visit us at the uh, Emilio Astronomy Center, and I invite everybody, anybody that comes to Emilio to visit Emily in, in the planetarium. She's uh, she's she's the star of that show there, and so yeah, I wanted to just thank everyone, uh, Derek, for participating. It was a, a pleasure for myself, and I know it was a pleasure for Emily to to take some time and, and share what what we know about the night sky. Yes, it's always amazing I, I, listening to you talk, Clippa. Uh, yeah, I, 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 th I thought this presentation was absolutely fantastic um, and um, opened up a whole new world and understanding of how important it is for cultures from all around the world and their view of the sky and how we as human species have used the night sky for, for you know, millennia and, uh, and, you, and still using it today and, so, uh, and how it connects all of us together as um, as, as a species. Um, so again, I want to thank both of you to, uh, for joining us this evening. It was a wonderful experience and definitely uh, on your next, when, when everything opens back up and we're able to travel again, please uh, consider uh, the Imaloa uh, Astronomy Center and all the amazing observatories uh, and of course all the amazing other things uh, in Hawaii that, that is offer. Um, so before we end, I just want to talk about some of the other events that we have coming up. Um, so tomorrow, we're not technically doing a virtual star party as usual. Um, what we're actually going to be doing instead is I'm getting up around 3 a.m. Uh, or staying up. I don't I haven't decided yet. Uh, and I'm joining with a, a good friend of mine. His name is Brett Somas. He's, um, he's in Australia near Sydney. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to use his telescopes to explore the skies of the southern hemisphere. We're going skies down under, if you will. And uh, we're going to be using his telescope system to look at some of the interesting objects that we can't see from this uh, location here in Florida or, you know, other parts of the United States. Um, so unfortunately, because we have to do it such early time here in the United States, in, in Florida, and, you know, he's eight, eight, eight hours ahead, um, we, um, we are, we're me I'm meeting uh, much earlier um, so uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be recording that and we're going to be releasing the YouTube video of that later on for you to for you all to uh, to watch. Uh, so our virtual star party this week is not as traditional as we used to as we as we have in the past. Um, but uh, hopefully you all get to uh, get a chance to enjoy that program when we upload it to our YouTube account. Uh, and next week, uh, our virtual public show for next uh, Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern time, we're, we're going to be joining with a fellow friend of ours from Seminole State, Professor uh, uh, Dr. Laura Nesser. She is going to be uh, joining us and talking all about the Earth. We're going to be talking about Terra, our planet. Um, and we're, and uh, she's a geologist, and it would be great to explore the Earth with an actual geologist and learn some interesting things about the, I think, I think I'm a little biased, the coolest planet in the solar system but you know some of you might have a different opinion about that but i think earth's pretty cool um so hopefully you get to continue on we're going to be uh producing uh other programs uh going forward and i want to thank you all for supporting uh us and other planetariums and other facilities and all the organizations that we've been doing and uh justin i forgot to mention one other event that's coming up here do you want to talk a little bit about that what what this event that's coming up on saturday Sure, absolutely. Yes, we. Um, if if you've been following us for I don't know maybe the last month or so, we had a real really cool event with the Smithsonian, and they had invited several planet uh, several astronomy groups in each time zone in North America to do a national nighttime virtual star party, and that was an absolute blast. We looked at nebula, we looked at galaxies. Uh, uh, comets. It, it was a fantastic night. Well, uh, we are going to be celebrating the sun this Saturday for a national, uh, what, what are we calling it? Solarcation? 
it's What's actually great name they gave Sunday, it? but it's not on Sunday. It's on Saturday. So I know it's kind of confusing, but that's just how it roll, how we roll here. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. So a virtual star party all about one star, uh, the most important star, right? Our sun. So I imagine live telescope views in each time zone. It's beginning at 1030 a.m. Eastern. And uh, join in. I think, are we up first for this one again? We are, yeah, because in Florida, we always have our nicest skies in the morning, and then usually we get our afternoon thunderstorms. Uh, but, yeah, we'll be having a telescope set up for that, um, and others uh, all around the United States are going to be doing the same. So definitely uh, we'll be linking that. Uh, it's, a, it's a YouTube uh, YouTube live event, so we'll be linking you all with that, uh, with that uh, YouTube uh, link later on uh, so you can join us for that. So this is going to be a very exciting event. If you, uh, of course, you never want to look at the sun with your eyes, but this is a chance for you to explore the sun uh, in a much, in a very unique way. I think uh, every telescope is different, using a different, looking at different wavelengths of the sun, um, uh, both white light, hydrogen, alpha, and I think some of uh, some of the other members might have, even have calcium uh, telescopes. So we have some really cool views of the sun coming up uh, on Saturday. So don't miss out on that. So, but uh, yeah, anyway, so thank you all for spending some time with us exploring the, uh, the concepts and introduction to wayfinding. And hopefully uh, you, this inspires you to learn more about uh, this amazing um, uh, method of astronomy navigation. And uh, with that, I want to thank you all for joining us this evening and uh, have a great evening and we'll see you next time. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye now.